Good morning. Our first item of business today is general questions. Question number one from Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact might be on NHS staffing levels in Scotland from the reported drop in the number of EU citizens applying to live and work in the UK. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Data from the ONS reveals that EU migration has fallen by 85,000 since the 2016 referendum, with just under 6% of our medical workforce, 5% of nurses and midwives, 10% of dentists, and 5.5% of adult social care staff from the EU EEA. This decline is of significant concern. Curtailing free movement of EU nationals in the UK as a result of Brexit will have potentially serious consequences for the recruitment and retention of health and social care workers in Scotland. Bill Kidd. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this issue underlines the difficulty that Brexit poses in unduly causing the loss of our qualified and skilled individuals from our dedicated public services workforce? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, indeed I do. Uh, and further to that, I mean, I think it is important to say, as my colleague Mr Russell uh, said yesterday, it's important uh, to emphasise yet again that it is in, in our interest to attract people from across the EU uh, to visit, work and study and live in Scotland and that freedom of movement isn't a burden at all for us but a boon and something that we should not celebrate its ending. In addition, the UK government's uh, current uh, approach on uh, immigration uh, will not serve Scotland well. Uh, the majority of jobs in the social care sector are likely to fall below the estimated threshold uh, with uh, current average salaries indicating that between 30 and 40 percent of those roles will earn less than that threshold uh, and that that in itself not only in terms of the EU nationals and the ending of freedom of movement which will damage uh, our health and social care service at a time of anticipated additional demand in addition the immigration uh, proposals from the UK government will not assist us at all and simply underline not only should we not be leaving the European Union, but immigration policy should be in the hands of this Parliament. Question number two, Keith Brown. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Stirling and Clipmanager City region deal. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The Scottish Government shares the frustration of regional partners in having the Stirling and Clipmanager deal finalised. I wrote to the returning Secretary of State for Scotland on the 19th of December following the election urging Mr Jack to agree to sign this deal on the 22nd of January, uh, the date being held by regional partners for signing the deal. I have yet to receive a response from Mr Jack, though my officials continue to engage in pursuit of this date. Keith Brown. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and note that, as he will be aware, as part of the Heads of Terms, Club Manager was allocated £8 million capital fund by the UK Government, which they stated had to be fully committed to projects within a year. A year ago, the local decision-making body, the Club Manager Commission, submitted their preferred projects to the UK Government and have been waiting for a final decision ever since. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it's completely unacceptable that, particularly as we head towards the full deal sign-off, the Council and local organisations are still waiting to find out how this funding will be allocated, leaving them unable to progress with the in-depth business cases that were required to be used to access these funds. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator Officer, I fully agree uh, with uh, Keith Brown on this matter. It is entirely unacceptable. Uh, regional partners are eager to develop their full business case uh, in order to make sure that they can deliver the inclusive economic growth that they are seeking to deliver across, across Clackmanager and Stirling as part of this deal. Uh, and as has been stated, uh, the UK uh, government have set aside this £8 million aspect of the deal, uh, which is for capital investment uh, projects. Uh, Clark Manager Council and other regional partners have fully engaged uh, with the UK Government as fully as one could expect and as yet, uh, uh, even though we are reaching the uh, final days in preparation for the signing of this deal, the UK Government have not uh, conveyed any decisions on this issue. Uh, this is unacceptable. Uh, my officials will continue to work with regional partners on this matter and we will continue to pursue the UK Government on the details of this fund. Mark Ruskell. Given that only a fifth of the city deal funding across Scotland is supporting transport priorities, 
How will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that spending supports both a climate emergency and inclusive economic growth opportunities? And in particular, will he rule out supporting the View Forth Link Road through the deal while ruling in support for Stirling, Alloa, Dunfermline rail reopening? Cabinet Secretary. Ebside, Ebside officer, funding through city deals and uh, growth deals is only one aspect of investing in infrastructure and other projects within local authority and regional authority areas. Uh, we have a whole range of different funding streams that provide a whole range of activities where to help to reduce uh, the use of transport, whether it be through active travel or other alternative means. For example, in the Stirling and Clark Manager deal, uh, there is some £7 million of additional active travel funding being provided uh, to help to support uh, the greater use of walking and cycling uh, and to encourage the use of low carbon uh, transport. And an additional £17 uh, million is being provided for Scotland's International Environment Centre in order to provide a space to conduct cutting edge research into uh, tackling global environmental uh, challenges. So the Stirling and Clark Manager deal is a very good example of taking forward measures to tackle climate change, but that sits alongside the wider measures which we take forward out with city deals and growth deals specifically. And Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary welcome the plans for a UK government-funded International Tartan Innovation Centre to be located in the centre of Stirling as part of the city regional deal? A centre which will showcase the unique history of Tartan and greatly benefit the local economy in Stirling. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, of course, uh, President Officer, I, I do welcome investment that's been made by the UK Government. I like uh, the uh, £17 million that's been invested by the Scottish Government into the Scottish Environment Centre, the Digital District, the Regional Digital Hub Programme and also the Culture, Tourism and Heritage Investments of some £15 million that's also been made by the Scottish Government. Having said that, I would like the UK Government to get round to signing this deal and despite repeated attempts to try and get the UK Government to come to a finalised agreement on this deal, we have not been able to make progress on the matter. And I hope that the Member will encourage his colleagues at Westminster to get their act together and to get this deal signed so that partners can get on with delivering it. Question number three, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed the Falkirk and Grangemouth investment zone with the UK Government. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I discussed the Falkirk growth deal with the UK Government during a call with the Secretary of State for Scotland on the 19th of September. I then wrote to Mr Jack in October urging him to provide clarity on the UK Government's intended investment in the deal. Uh, I have yet to receive a response. Uh, next week I will participate in a Falkirk and Grangemouth Investment Zone conference hosted by Falkirk Council. And I will take the opportunity to reinforce the Scottish Government's commitment to a growth deal for Falkirk and press the UK Government to confirm their intended level of investment in the deal. Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks, uh, President Officer. It's disappointing to hear that Alistair Jack hasn't responded. Um, the, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the clear wish of the Falkirk Council administration to see this move forward at a pace, uh, as we all do. He'll also be aware of Falkirk Council's climate emergency declaration and its ambition for Grangemouth to be a zero carbon town by 2030. Given Grangemouth is home to some of Scotland's highest CO2 emitting industries, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that Falkirk Council should be given every assistance to reach that goal? and that the Falkirk and Grangemouth Investment Zone deal must take cognizance of the need to achieve net zero CO2 emissions by 2030 and net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases by 2045. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I have been encouraged by the submission put forward by Falkirk Council and its partners uh, in relation to the proposed deal. Uh, whilst we aren't in a position to commit to individual projects at this stage, uh, the deal could potentially be transformational in terms of its impact on reducing emissions and officials will continue to work with the local partners in developing these proposals. Uh, the Scottish Government is working in partnership with the energy intensive industries to build on the considerable existing strengths of the industry across Scotland and also to highlight that the uh, industrial decarbonisation uh, route is one which also presents significant economic investment opportunities. Uh, we'll continue to coordinate activity across partners and we will continue to engage with Scottish Enterprise and Falkirk Council in pursuing the skills and expertise that's also required to go alongside the important element of the Grangemouth Industrial uh, Cluster. So I can assure the member we will continue to do everything we can to make progress on this issue and I'll continue to engage with Falkirk Council and other partners as we look to make progress on the deal. 
Thank you. Question number four, Anas Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the independent review of the issues at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. The independent review of Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, which is co-chaired by Drs Andrew Fraser and Brian Montgomery, remains on track to deliver its report by spring 2020. The review has heard evidence from whistleblowers and a wide range of staff and will now hear evidence from hospital managers and contractors. Whilst Lord Brodie will determine the proceedings of the public inquiry and how to gather evidence, I anticipate that the inquiry team will be able to consider the review's published findings as a key piece of evidence for their work. And During the Christmas recess, it was revealed that the Scottish Government were informed of Millie contracting stenotrophomonas at the time in 2017, that the Health Board failed to report Millie's death to the Procurator Fiscal, and more recently, that the Health Board had been issued with a notification of contravention letter and an improvement notice by the Health and Safety Executive in relation to the ventilation system and failing to protect high-risk patients who are vulnerable to infections. There is a connection to this and the water supply. Parents, staff and the public don't trust the Board, so are looking to you, Cabinet Secretary. Can you take this opportunity to respond to these revelations and study what steps are being taken? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as, as Mr Sarwar knows, um, the, one of the uh, principal steps that are being, that are being taken is, is the escalation of the board to level four, which involves uh, the direct intervention and leadership of Scottish Government uh, under uh, the leadership of Professor uh, Fiona McQueen, our Chief Nursing Officer. I actually met the Oversight Board this morning uh, to uh, update them or to have their update on the progress of the work that they're undertaking uh, in three crit critical areas, uh, looking at the immediate issues uh, in terms of infection uh, prevention and control, which will involve that detailed case-by-case -case review from 2015 to date, as, as well as the second uh, work stream, which involves a direct engagement with parents and families uh, and has those individuals uh, on its work, and the third one on technical issues. <clears throat> that uh, oversight board and the work that it has undertaken is specifically in response to the escalation at, to level four that I informed Parliament uh, of and the issues around which it has been escalated to level four. Alongside that, of course, runs in parallel the independent inquiry. Mr Sawa has asked about uh, independent review, rather, and then the public inquiry. Uh, on the first, in terms of the work of the oversight board, uh, I have, as I said, uh, in December, uh, an intention to report uh, and make a statement to this Parliament by the end of this month on the progress that has been made there and the engagement and involvement of families in all of those matters. Uh, the inquiry, as I've, the independent review, as I've said, is on track to report in the spring. And again, in the coming weeks, I intend to be uh, back to the Parliament advising uh, you all of the terms of uh, the remit of the public inquiry and its stand-up date, having first, as I've already committed, uh, consulted with families on that remit and consulted with party spokespeople on that remit. So all of that work is underway. I completely appreciate the level of significant interest, understandably and rightly, that those families and the wider public have in this matter. Uh, I can assure the Chamber and Mr Sawa in particular that I continue to be involved in a daily basis on understanding and driving the work that we need to drive in order uh, to both receive answers to many of these questions, but to ensure that going forward, all the necessary steps are being taken to ensure that infection prevention and control across that campus, but particularly for those most vulnerable groups, is of the standard that we require it to be. Thank you. And Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if all reports have now been shared with the Scottish Government and also with all the reviews un being undertaken? And given that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have announced that they're taking legal action against the contractor, what advice have Scottish Ministers given to the Board on that issue? And what advice are they giving to NHS Lothian as well, given the sick kids in this city? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> so I can confirm that all the reports that we are aware of uh, have now been shared with Scottish Government, and that includes the ACOM report, uh, not yet published, uh, but is uh, the basis on which the Board, uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, uh, received legal advice uh, that it is now progressing. Uh, I have uh, uh, told the Board that the legal advice now needs to advise them 
on uh, how quickly they can publish that ACOM report so that it is public and if there are any aspects of it that require to be retained uh, because they may otherwise uh, have implications for their success of, or otherwise of their core action, uh, that they should be clear about what those parts are. And I would uh, hope to understand that uh, from the board in the coming weeks so that that report can be published. At that point, I believe all relevant reports uh, and uh, pieces of information are in the public domain and are known to the Scottish Government and therefore to the Oversight Board. In terms of the legal advice uh, that Greater Glasgow and Clyde received on the, uh, whether or not there were grounds for a potential court action on particular aspects uh, of matters, that is entirely for the Board as the contract holder uh, to receive and the Scottish Government has no locus in providing that legal advice or in intervening in it, although of course uh, we require to be made aware of it. Uh, in terms of how that may then impact or not on NHS Lothian uh, and its contract, uh, I uh, know that the uh, board of NHS Lothian are aware of the issues uh, in Glasgow and they will take their own view and seek their own legal advice again as the, the holders of the contract. Uh, and at this point, I'm not aware from NHS Lothian of any particular decisions they may have made in that regard, but I would expect to, to be aware uh, and uh, again for that to be a, in the public domain. Thank you. Question five has not been lodged. Question six, Joanne Lamond. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether Glasgow City Council has received appropriate support from the Ending Homelessness Together Fund. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. We have uh, set aside £32.5 million of the Government's £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund to support local authorities with the implementation of their rapid rehousing transition plans and Housing First. Glasgow City Council received £301,000 uh, to develop their rapid rehousing transition plan in 2018-19. Uh, they've received £1,332,000 to implement their plan in 2019-20. In 2020-21, we plan to award Glasgow £1.237 million towards the implementation uh, of their transition plan. Uh, confirmation of this funding is subject to the outcome of the Scottish Government spending review and parliamentary approval of the 2020-21 budget. Uh, this funding is an addition to the budget available to local authorities to support homelessness and we will continue to work with all councils on our shared goal of ending homelessness and supporting uh, people right across Scotland. Joanne Lamond. That was a long response but didn't answer my question. The Minister will, I am sure, be aware that a report from Glasgow City Council has highlighted that it has received funding for its rapid rehousing transition planning, but that funding is, quote, significantly less than what we bid for to enable us to meet all of the targets set out in the plan and recommended writing to the Scottish Government in relation to future funding arrangements. Does the Minister recognise that without sufficient funding, the homelessness crisis in Glasgow cannot be tackled effectively? Will the Minister respond to this request? Will he accept that the persistent and disproportionate cuts to Glasgow City Council have had a massive impact on its ability to support vulnerable people? And what representations has he made as a Housing Minister to the Finance Secretary to ensure that local services are fully funded and to ensure that the Scottish Government's policy on homelessness is more than lip service? Minister. President officer, uh, our policy to tackle homelessness here in Scotland is much more in lip service and I would point out uh, to the member uh, that we put in place the £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund before receiving the HARSAG recommendations about what was required to tackle homelessness here in Scotland. We put the money uh, where it was required and we will continue to do so. In terms of rapid rehousing transition monies, um, I uh, took uh, 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 soundings from local authorities uh, across Scotland and that's why the initial £15 million that was put into that became £24 million. Now, this money is to allow 
uh, local authorities to transform their services. This is additional money beyond the monies that they should already be spending on homelessness services. And I hope that local authorities, including Glasgow, will take advantage of this additional money, transform services and help end homelessness here in Scotland.